Today we are actually talking about music. Open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 15, please. We're in a series in the book of Exodus, trusting in the great I am, and we saw how the God who reveals himself as I am who I am showed his power by delivering his children from slavery in Egypt. He did that through the plagues and then through parting of the sea. And last week in chapter 14, how we, we saw how God miraculously brought the children of Israel through the sea. And we saw how then God judged Pharaoh and his army in that sea. And today we learn from chapter 15 that God is worthy of our praise. And that's what we did this morning through music. And we have to continue our worship through teaching and learning of God's Word. Everything that we say and do should actually be a response to who God is and what He has done. That's what worship really is. Now, in chapter 14, we saw how God delivered them. And in chapter 15, actually, we'll see the same thing. Actually, chapters 14 and 15 cover the same thing. Just chapter 14 is in prose, and chapter 15 is poetry. So chapter 14 would be about worship, W-A-R, ship, and chapter 15 is about worship, W-O-R, ship. I don't know if there's a difference in how you say it, is there? Worship and worship, I don't know. <coughs> Here's one of my favorite definitions of worship, and then we will read part of chapter 15. Think about this definition before I read uh, the text. This comes from one of my uh, former colleagues, Alan Ross, in his book, Recalling the Hope of Glory. This is how he defines worship. And this is only a part of the definition because it's longer. But I want you to think about this definition as we're going to read chapter or part of chapter 15. True worship is the celebration of being in covenant fellowship with the sovereign and triune God, holy triune God, the one that we just sang about, holy, holy, holy. By means of the reverent adoration and spontaneous praise of God's nature and works, the expressed commitment of trust and obedience to the covenant responsibilities, all with a confident anticipation of the fulfillment of the covenant promises and glory. I mean, that, that's such a loaded definition. And again, I left some stuff out because it was even longer than that. But I want you to think about that as I read part of chapter 15. Chapter 14 described how God delivered his children through the sea. And now chapter 15 basically says the same thing, but in poetry form. This is Hebrew poetry, but it's a song. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang the song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floors covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrown your adversaries. You send them out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters pile up. The floods stood up in a heap. The depths, the deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind, and the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among gods? 
who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. You stretched out your hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them because of the greatness of your arm. They are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by. Till the people pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Let's pray. Dear Father, as we contemplate about who you are and what you have done, I pray that our response will be one of, of praise. And we will learn today what it means to respond to who you are and what you have done. And by the end, I pray that all of us will be able to sing your praises. I pray for those who are here this morning and they, they're not singing your praising, praises. They, they might be singing their own praises or someone else's praises. Pray that today will be the day of salvation and today they will surrender their lives to you. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. True worship is the celebration of being in a covenant fellowship with the sovereign and holy triune God. By means of the reverent adoration and spontaneous praise of God's nature and works, the expressed commitment of trust and obedience to the covenant responsibilities, all with a confident anticipation of the fulfillment of the covenant promises in glory. My dear brothers and sisters, we learned that the first thing we need to do is we need to respond to who God is and what He has done by praising God for His victory. That's what we have in the first verse. <coughs> then Moses and the people of Israel sang the song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider He has thrown into the sea. Verses 4 and 5. Various chariots and his host he cast into the sea, and his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. I like this because Moses leads by example. Notice how it starts here. He is leading the choir of over a million Israelites in singing praises to the Lord. And you might say, well, if I would have that choir, I would sing in that choir too. But you're asked to sing in this choir this morning. That's what we did together as a congregation. We sang praises to God because He deserves it, because He gave us victory. And not just a temporary victory, but He gave us victory, eternal victory to the person and work of Jesus Christ. We have so much more to praise God for than even the Israelites had. Have you ever think about, thought about that? We have a lot more to praise God for, but I'm grateful I'm also grateful that the sheet music was not preserved. <coughs> I'm grateful that we don't have the sheet music from Moses' song. Because I know somewhere there would be some people would say, well, Tiberius, that's how they sang it 3,500 years ago. That's how we should sing it today. <laughs> I'm also grateful that we don't have the sheet music from the Psalms. You know, the whole book of Psalms was supposed to be sung. It was their hymnal. And we don't have one piece of sheet music, and I'm grateful about that. Because you know what? If we were to put this to music, and I'm sure some people have done it, I will sing to the Lord for your triumph gloriously would sound different in Michigan than in Mazatlan, Mexico. And it would sound different in Indiana 
than it would sound in India. Why? Can God use personal cultural music to praise Him? Yes. Don't let anybody know. Don't let anybody tell you that there's only one way to sing. Don't let anybody tell you there's only one way to praise God. The American way. The Michigan way. The Calvary way. Because I'm telling you, that is not true. The reason there is no shit music here, which is very good, because what matters here is the message. We need to praise God for His victory, and that might sound different in other parts of the world, but the song, the, the music, should, the words should be the same. I'm grateful that we still have the words. The song praises God for His victory. God defeated the gods of Egypt through the plagues, and now God defeated Pharaoh and his army by sinking them into the sea. Now, there are benefits of us singing together, my dear brothers and sisters. I'm just going to mention two. <coughs> Why do we sing together? Well, there are two main reasons. I'm only going to give you two. There are books written about this, by the way. I'm only going to give you two. First of all, when we sing together, it unifies the congregation. When we sing together, it shows unity. We show unity. The congregation does the same thing together at the same time. How often does that happen in a worship service? Not all the time. You know, some preach, some listen, some sleep, some, right? But when we all sing together, we all sing together. Isn't that good? It unifies the congregation. Young and old sing together. That's why the young, are, it's good for the young to be in the congregation because we teach them by example. And by the way, it would be good for us to teach them while we're in the car, while we're at home. Why, what would happen if what we sing in church is just a continuation of what we just did in the car on the way to church? What would happen if singing together in the congregation is just a continuation of what we did at home? Now, I have to confess, I did not do with this very well with my, with my kids. <coughs> so, from that perspective, I have failed as a parent. I did give them, you know, piano lessons and I, you know, all that, but I didn't do a very good job about teaching them how to sing together with us. But my brother has. And my brother, my, uh, the one who's in the middle, I have two older brothers, the one in the middle taught their ch his children very young. When they sit at the table, they sing together the great doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. That's how they start the meal together. So when they come to church and they sing it, is that a surprise for them? Can they say, we never heard that before? No. But my brother, I think, has got that one right. Teach your children to praise God at home, in the car. And when they come to church, that's just a continuation of their praise to God. Parents, grandparents, children, grandchildren are singing together in the congregation. That unifies us. Think about that. The, the techno technological advances that we have actually left, leaves us more disconnected, doesn't it? All of us are with our devices, and what's supposed to connect us actually disconnects us. But what happens if we would put those down and together we would sing the praises of God? My dear brothers and sisters, singing in the congregation unites us. Second of all, it strengthens the congregation. When we sing together, we proclaim truth together. And if you paid attention to the words that we sang this morning, we sang truth. We sang truth, and that's important. We sang, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Is that truth? That's truth. It's not only biblical truth spoken, written, but now it's sung. In a, in a world that promotes lies, we need to speak truth. And the most loving thing we can do to a generation that buys in those lies is to tell them the truth. And it's not what they want to hear, trust me. But the most loving thing we can do is to speak the truth. Whether in spoken form or through singing. We sang together, I have a maker. 
He formed my heart. Do you believe that? I know you do. That's truth. It speaks against the, the lies of evolution and other things that the world teaches. I have a maker. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hand. That is truth. Singing together, my dear brothers and sisters, when we sing truth, strengthens the congregation. One scholar said, show me a church's songs and I'll show you their theology. Oh, that's good. Show me a church's songs and I'll show you their theology. James Montgomery Boyce described music as, and I quote, a gift from God that allows us to express our deepest heart responses to God and His truth in meaningful and memorable ways. It is a case of our hearts joining with our minds to say, yes, 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 to the truths we are embracing. And look what it says here, that Moses and the people of Israel sang to the song. So who sang? Everybody did, right? Everybody did. Actually, one rabbi went even further to suggest even the babies sang. <coughs> and so I like well, actually when we have babies in the congregation and I hear them, you know, crying or murmuring, doing whatever. That's a sign that the church is alive. I know some of you think when the baby cries, you should take him out, well, you know, whatever. No, when the baby cries in the congregation, that tells me this church is alive. You might disagree with me, but you have the right to be wrong. All right. <coughs> this is what the rabbi wrote, and I quote, Even the sucklings dropped their mother's breast to join in singing. Yea, even the embryos in the womb joined the melody. And the angels' voices swelled the song. Oh, I like that. Everybody sang. And we need to praise God for his victory. And we need to praise God for who he is. Because he is the source of strength and song. The Lord is my strength and my song, verse 2. And he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. If you come, came this week, this Sunday here, it's because God gave you strength to come here. And that is the reason for praise. We have reasons to praise God. He is the one who gives us not just strength, but breath. He is the one who saves us, the Bible says here. Worship includes praising God and exalting God. By definition, the word worship in English, that's what it is. It's a combination. It's from Old English. Worth, the word worth, and ship. Meaning, when we worship, we assign worth to someone or something. All of us worship. Either we worship the true God or we worship false gods or ourselves or things. When we say we worship God, we assign worship and we say that you are worthy to be praised. Verse 3, the Lord is a man of word, the Lord is his name. The Lord is a man of word is an anthropomorphism. It doesn't mean that God is a man. It's a figure of speech to where you assign human attributes to God. That's why it's called an anthropomorphism. This means that Yahweh acts like a warrior. Psalm 24, 8 refers to God as mighty in battle. Many other passages call God Yahweh Sabaoth. Remember, the Lord of hosts means he's the commander in chief. That's how the Bible describes him. Yes, God is loving and merciful, but he's also holy, righteous, and just, and he must punish sin. And when he does that, he becomes a warrior. And that should prompt us to sing together. There's a time when we should say, let's sing together. But notice, please, there's also a first-person emphasis here. I will praise him. I will exalt him. We need to sing together as a congregation. But if we don't sing individually, how will we be able to sing corporately? Notice, please, there's singing together, but there's also the I will sing to the Lord. I will exalt Him. And we need to praise God. And we need to praise God for His power. Verse 6 through 9 
Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. Notice, please, the first five verses are about God. And now starting in verse 6, we are addressing God. It's the song to God. Now, your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. There's a shift here. <coughs> in the greatness of your majesty, verse 7, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the hearts of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Did they do that? No, they didn't because God and his right hand gave them the victory. You remember I said last time the Egyptians took pride in their two-wheeled chariots and their swords. But God's weapons are unconventional. Notice, please, it says how God wins the victory. He wins the battle with one hand tied behind his back, only with his right hand. And not with the chariots, not with the sword, but with the blast of his nostrils. Obviously, these are figures of speech, my dear brothers and sisters. Whenever you read Hebrew poetry, pay attention to the figures of speech. They are not to be taken literally. God is spirit, infinite, and perfect. He doesn't have a body. But when you want to talk about his power, you talk about his right hand. He doesn't have a nose like you and I. But when we talk about his anger, his nostrils blow and the sea comes apart. And the Pharaoh's army drowns. These are figures of speech that talk about God's incomparable power. And our hymns do that too. I'm reminded of the great Martin Luther King. A mighty fortress is our God. <coughs> this October will celebrate the Reformation again, right? It's a very big year reminding of the Reformation. And one of the hymns that Martin Luther wrote talks about this power. When he asks, did we in our great, in our own strength confined, our striving would be losing? Were not the right man on our side, the man's of God's own choosing? Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. That's a lot of theology in the hymn, and I only read one verse. That's what's great about the hymns and the songs we sing, because they contain theology. And we need to praise God for his power, and we also praise God that he destroys the mocker. See, the, the Pharaoh and his army, they were proud and they were mocking. Look, look what they do. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide, I will do this, I will do this. But that's not what happened. God says, Moses says about God, you blew your wind and the sea covered them. They sank like, wed in the, like lead in the mighty waters. My dear friend, if you are in the mocker camp this morning, I have bad news for you. If you don't turn to God in repentance, you will be destroyed. But I also have good news for you. That doesn't have to be the case. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to save sinners such as you and I. And today is still the day of grace and still the day of salvation. So you can have a chance today for, to move from the mocker camp into the, the praise camp. Isn't that good news? That's good news. That's good news. But you also have to understand the bad news. If you don't repent, you will perish. Don't overestimate your abilities, especially when you go against the creator and the sustainer of the universe. Paul writes in Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. So may I ask you, what song are you singing today? Are you singing the song of the redeemed? Or are you singing the song of the mocker? You have a chance to switch allegiances 
today. And if you switch and you become a believer and you follow Jesus Christ, then you, like all of us, get to praise God for His incomparable holiness. Who like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in His holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? This is a rhetorical question. Who is like you, O Lord? What's the answer? No one. If your name is Michael or Michelle, your name is based on the root of this question. In Hebrew, is a question. Mika Yahweh. Who is like Yahweh? So if your name is Michael or Michelle, that's what it is. It's a question. Who is like God? You have a beautiful name. And you can use that to testify of God's incomparable holiness. Moses praises God for his supremacy, awe-inspiring in praise, a wonder worker, the Bible says here, one who does wonders. I don't know about you, but I still need the God of the Exodus, one who can do miracles, right? Oh, yeah, we, can, we still need the God of the Exodus, a miracle-making God, a powerful, awe-inspiring, miracle-working God. I'm reminded of the 19th century hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That's where that's inspired from, to praise God for His holiness. Early in the morning my song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons, blessed Trinity. We need to praise God for His incomparable holiness, and we need to praise Him for His leading, His loving leading. Okay, verse 13. See, those who realize how much God loves them, praise God. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. And then verse 14 shows how God's power and His reputation is sending shockwaves to the neighboring countries. Verse 14 mentions Philistia. Verse 15 mentions Edom, Moab, Canaan. Terror, verse 16 says, and dread fall upon all of them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone till your people, O Lord, pass by. You bring them by. God, my dear brothers and sisters, leads us because, of, because He loves us. I'm reminded of the great 19th century hymn, He leadeth me, O blessed thought. O words with heavenly comfort fraught, whatever I do, whatever I be, still it is God's hand that leadeth me. Do you still need the God of the Exodus? I do. A God who leads me with His love. A God who protects me with His right hand. A God who gives me victory. And because of that, my dear brothers and sisters, we need to praise Him for His eternal reign. See, whatever happened in Exodus for the Israelites was temporary, but whatever God is doing with us through Christ is eternal. And this I started in the Old Testament. The Lord will reign forever and ever, says Exodus 15 through 18. And then when David prays in 1 Chronicles 16, 13, he says the same thing. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice and let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Psalm 93, 1, the Lord reigns. What do you think we'll read at the end of the Bible? Can you take a wild guess? Revelation 19, 6. Revelation 19, 6. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of the many waters and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord of our God, the Almighty, does what? Reigns. The Lord reigns forever and ever. Do you know what forever and ever means? Forever and ever. We don't need any other translation. The English translation is very good. The Lord reigns forever and ever. I'm reminded of the great hymn. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory is won, in death, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. Do you need a God who leads you? I know I do. I still need the God of the Exodus, a miracle-making, loving, leading God. And notice, please, that the praise doesn't stop just through singing. It starts and it stops with, it goes on with singing and dancing. <gasps> 
<clears throat> oh man, don't kill the messenger, by the way. Uh, dear Tiberius, uh, we don't believe in dancing. Well, let's read the Bible together. <clears throat> Starting in verse 19. For when the horses of Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen went into the sea, the Lord brought back the waters of sea upon them, but the people of Israel walked on dry ground in the midst of the sea. Then Miriam, the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went after her with tambourines and dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. For the first time, Moses' sister is named. Moses' sister is introduced early in Exodus, in Exodus chapter 2. But she's not given, we are not given her name until chapter 15. And we are told in chapter 2 that she's just Moses' sister. But now she's named Miriam, but is, she's not introduced as Moses' sister. She's introduced as a prophetess and as Aaron's sister. Now, I don't know why it, that is. All I know is this, that in the Bible we have five women that are godly prophetesses and two that are evil or false prophetesses. Five women that are called prophetesses and are godly. They are Yahweh worshipers and obey Yahweh. Deborah, in Judges 4.4, 4, if you take notes. Huldah, in 2 Kings 22.14. Isaiah's wife, in Isaiah 8.3, she's not named. Anna, in Luke 2.36. And then, of course, Miriam, in this text, in Exodus. The two women that are false prophetesses are Noadiah in Nehemiah 6.14 and the false prophetess in Revelation 2.20 that is called Jezebel. <clears throat> but here, I want us to understand that Miriam didn't just sing the first verse. By the way, what she's singing is exactly what Moses sang. The words are identical. But we are just told that she does the same thing that Moses does. One commentator says, puts it like this, and I quote, This popular English title is somewhat misleading since the text states that Miriam recites only the first line of the song. However, a midrash has it that Miriam and the women actually recite the entire song. These verses affirm the custom chronicled in Judges 11.34 and 1 Samuel 18.6 of women going forth with music and dancing to hail the returning victorious hero, although in the present instance it is God and not man who is actually the victor. What is the timeless principle? The timeless principle is this. God is triumphant because of his great power, prompting praise and dedication in those who are delivered. In other words, my dear brothers and sisters, we are asked to respond to who God is and what he has done by praising him and by obeying him in complete dedication. Moses gave a temporary victory, but when we go to the New Testament and Paul talks about victory over sin and death, that victory is only achieved through Jesus Christ. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you victorious? If you are in Christ, you are victorious. And that's why you need to have Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, to have victory not just for time, but for eternity. Christmas is fast approaching, and there's a newer Christmas song that I like. Don't worry, I will not be singing. <coughs> Although I do give you permission to listen, to start listening to Christmas songs. It is never too early. The song goes like this. How many kings step down from their thrones? 
How many lords have abandoned their homes? How many greats have become the least for me? How many gods have poured out their hearts to romance a world that has torn all apart? How many fathers gave up their sons for me? How many? Only one did that for me. How many kings? Only one. And his name is Jesus Christ. So as application, praise him for who he is and praise him for what he has done. And that's what we're going to do now. That will go to the organ and we will sing together. Praise him, praise him. And if you read carefully in the book of Revelation, something very interesting in chapter 15, verses 2 and 3. John records the revelation of heaven, and I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image, and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps and God in their hand. And they sing the song of, can you guess? Moses. What? At the end of time, they're singing the song of Moses. Exodus, from Exodus to Revelation, we have people who are praising God for who he is. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great are amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty, just as true are your ways. Are you going to be part of the heavenly choir? Or are you still in the part that's singing the song of the mocker? If you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, don't wait. We'll have people who can pray with you here afterwards, or you can put on, your, on this uh, Calvary connection card, say, hey, I, I want to talk to someone. I want to give my life to Christ. I'm sick and tired of sing, singing the song of the mocker. I want to praise God. Let's stand together and praise Him. Praise Him. Praise Him. the benediction. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 
To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And everybody said, Amen. Have a great week.